And I'm going to finish off with talking about a deep, deeper understanding of the issues at hand. Not only in the first half I'll be looking at mainly at the problems, the second half we're going to be looking at some of the solutions. I put possible answers because a the theme that I will keep coming back to all evening are the answers that have got to come from within you. Everything this is an inside job, inside out, as regards uh, personal development, physical fitness, whatever sort of lifestyle change you want to make. We're not going to be looking to add anything. Okay? So, making it stick. The challenge. We all know what it takes. It's not, a, it's not astrophysics. We know, basically, that unless there is a, um, a medical impediment, to the contrary, we just have to eat better and move more. It's essentially very simple. Okay? Very, very simple. But is it? It's obviously not, because so many, I mean, there's probably some people here that don't have a problem doing it, but so many of us have a huge problem actually making it stick. So there's yo-yo dieting, there's people that, I mean, hands up, how many people have ever joined a gymnasium and gone for a couple of times or even not gone at all? Come on, throw me a bone, come on, come on, see ya. <laughs> All right, okay. It's quite incredible, isn't it, that they, are, they take 500 pounds from us and they actually want us to attend? It's, it's ridiculous. I am actually joined a gym recently um, because of particular lifestyle issues, and it's going very well. But they've put a Starbucks in the foyer. <laughs> <laughs> Someone explain that to me. Okay, every time I hear the dirty word exercise, I wash my mouth out with chocolate. It's actually Charles Schultz. I thought it was Joan Rivers, but Joan Rivers was. I, uh, I like to exercise to remember what heavy, heavy breathing sounds like. <laughs> so, the challenge. We know what it takes, but where's the problem? Where's the malfunction? The malfunction's in the discomfort zone. Now, our comfort zone is what is familiar to us, of course. What we do habitually, our learned behavior, our social conditioning, where we feel comfortable. But how comfortable is it? For many people, they're comfort zone is actually a very uncomfortable place. There's a general sense of malaise, uh, the feeling of being trapped or living in a rut. Or people can't really even put words into it. They just know they're not very happy. But they, even if they know what they would like to be doing, they just can't seem to break out of it. The discomfort zone is years in the making. I'm 55. It's difficult to believe, I know. <laughs> but I'm probably the oldest person in the room, actually. Uh, I'm 55, so there's over five decades of social conditioning on board. The good and the not so good. The things that I want to retain, maybe some things I want to dispense with. So there's a lot of it, and it's been around a long time, and it's the same for everybody. It's quite ingrained. So overcoming the inertia can obviously be quite a challenge. And for many people, the challenge can even be too great. The discomfort zone has them locked in so tight, although they feel so uncomfortable, they can't find a way of breaking out. And sometimes the goals they'd love to set, the, the aspirations they'd like to have, seem so far away that they actually disengage. They may as well be the Grand Canyon in between themselves and what they would like to do. So, the definition of our motivation, reasonable reasons for acting or behaving in a particular way. But are we doing it for our reasons? This is a huge problem with breaking out of discomfort zones. Be yourself, said Oscar Wilde. Everyone else is already taken. It's obvious. But if the reasons are yours, great. If they are not, you put any, any benefits you accrue, any advances you make, are at risk. Because the first time we come under stress, first time we hit a bump in the road, we can go back to our default settings. Because it's not from within us. It's not native to us. So it falls off very, very quickly. And that happens so often. That can happen if our goals and our motivations are formed on the basis of what we perceive other people think of us. There's an old adage in, uh, in self-help. Uh, what other people think of you is none of your business. First time somebody told me that, before I did this sort of work, I thought, what? Nah. <laughs> May, yeah, may, maybe, yes, no, it's yes, absolutely. We'll come on to more about that later. Are we pressured by, believe, by how we believe we should look? Attention, this is an incredible tripwire. If should is in your sentence when you're planning out a goal of any kind, health and wellness, whatever it may be, if should is in the title, it's a tripwire that something's up. 
But if you're saying, oh, well, yeah, I should, I should do something, I should do that, I should join a, the running club, I should get a bike, it means that it's not really part of you. You're not that enthusiastic about it. So beware of shoulds and woulds and coulds and maybes. Are we living up to the idea or body lifestyle promoted by the media? Now, it's so easy to throw the media under the bus, okay? And they do with all the power that they have. Yes, there does come with it a certain responsibility. The ownership has to be ours, ultimately. But they do have a huge, they do have a huge responsibility. Not long ago, there was something on the, I think it was a Huffington Press, one of the feeds that flows across our screens on a daily basis. And it was about a soap opera starlet who was on a beach in Ibiza being photographed by paparazzi, um, quote, unveiling her new body. It makes it sound a bit like a BMW. I, I think it was probably the body she's always had from the beginning, believe it or not. Um, the damaging thing is it creates and the media creates, and we help to fuel it, the media is also a reflection of ourselves, the idea of the ideal body, the perf the, of perfection, <coughs> what perfection may be, and it is then elevated onto a, a pedestal. It affects us all, but it particularly affects the young, very young people. And I was thinking of the, uh, the, unveiling, of the, the unveiling of the perfect body and thinking of the young girls not just, not exclusively young girls, but particularly young girls who will drive themselves to ill health and beyond in order to attain that perfect body that doesn't exist. Or on the other end of the scale, an even larger group of young women perhaps who are not perfect, have not, cannot aspire to be perfect because they're not very good. They love, value themselves so low that they won't even try. What's the point of me doing that? I can never be like that. It's extremely damaging. Ultimately, yes, it's our responsibility. And it's easier from, ad from adulthood and going on to handle that. For young people, the pressure is sometimes unsurmountable. Do we have unrealistic expectations? I'm not going to look the same now as I did when I was 30. Alan, get over it. <laughs> I wouldn't mind the hair, but that's another thing entirely. Are the expectations unrealistic? If they're unrealistic, they won't stick. We have to be cute about this. We've got to be intelligent about it. We'll talk about rational thought later on. It's very, very important. Is it a temporary fix? Are we thinking, well, I'll lose a few pounds to go to the wedding, and that will really get me kicked off. It probably won't. The amount of times I've lost weight to go on holiday, well, numerous but when you come back, you come back into your old ways, your old patterns, that sort of thing. The chances are it won't work. So, where is lasting change to be found? It is very simple, as in all the best things. Simplicity itself. Lasting change is to be found between what we do and what we are capable of doing. Not what other th people think we are, should be capable of doing. Not what we perceive, more to the point, other people think that we think or we are capable of doing. It's what we can actually do. Now Lao Tzu is uh, the ancient Chinese philosopher, is attributed with a saying, the journey of a thousand miles be begins with a single step. Now what I do is right here and now. What I'm capable of doing is one step away. It's across a line. I'm not talking about giant leaps. How far down the road do you want to go? It's entirely up to you. It's your show. And if you dictate how far you go down and how fast you move down it, the chances of it sticking are far greater than if you pushed. But it's just a line. And all we have to do is to step off. And it begins. Now, evolution or revolution? Revolution's great. Revolution is a brilliant. If you get up in the morning and decide one day, I'm going to give up smoking, some people can. Or, I'm, I don't know anybody, but there are people who say, I've heard it in, you read in the news, they decide next year I'm going to run the London Marathon. They've never probably run on their lives, and they do. Fantastic, brilliant, full respect. It's not typical. Is patience really a virtue? That is actually a rhetorical question. Yes, it is. In this day and age, though, it is, it is something, of an anath something of anathema. I will be looking at a couple more in the second half. 
The patience is often referred to as a bit of a wait and see, a little bit passive. We're all supposed to be a very proactive, can do, make things work and what have you. I was coaching um, a lady that works in the financial sector, very successful lady, and uh, she said, Alan, I can't turn my life upside down. I can't take giant leaps of faith. I can only walk in baby steps. I can do this in baby steps. I said, great. Baby steps is good. If you've had a toddler in your arms and you put them down, turn around to do something four seconds, turn around to pick them up, and they're either halfway up the stairs or they're on their way down the drive to play with the traffic. They haven't moved very quickly. The difference is they haven't stopped. It's forward momentum, essentially. And that's what we're talking about. Set the pace that suits you. Don't allow it to be set. Once you get over the line, once you step off, things in life begin, begin to change. And your goals may vary and your pace may vary, but it still has to be yours. New habits, exactly the same thing. Old habits, they take years of symbiosis to take on. New habits aren't going to take that long because you're actively, actively working on them. But the same thing applies. They still have to be your habits. Things perhaps you did in your past, things you enjoyed doing, things you would like to try out. But they have to be yours. Different thinking. There is no addition, just subtraction. We're not trying to, I'm not advocating that we add anything as to, the, to what you're thinking. It's how you think about it that counts. And the subtraction is, well, yes, it's removing what I would refer to as negative conditioning. And those negative habits and belief systems that we've had in our past, identifying. Those we can remove, but it's not about adding. You've got everything you're going to need to get this done. But you're going to do it your way, on your terms. You need the head game. Just like elite sportsmen, it's exactly the same thing. Elite sportsman can be as fit as you like. He can do, he can do uh, the distances and the times and hit the best shots he like in practice. It doesn't count until they're in the event itself. And that's where the head game counts. It's exactly the same for us. No different. Just because we're mere mortal. Okay, the discomfort zone. Breaking out. What do we need? We need desire. All this conditioning that we've got, the way that we've been in the past, it's going to put up a fight. It's not going to go quietly. And we need the desire behind it to make it work. We've got to want it. We've got to want it bad. Imagination. It's about challenging our conditioning, looking at our lives in a detached way or from slightly different perspectives. We cannot get out of, a, we cannot get out of a, a, a negative situation by using the same tactics that we used to get into it. We've got to run at it from a different angle. I always say to my people that I'm coaching, if you've got an obstacle in the way, you can go around it, through it, over it, kick it over. I'll help you to kick it down. But it doesn't have to be just, we don't have to just try and hurdle over the top of it. Honesty, <laughs> this is a tough one. We have to be honest with ourselves. That's in being realistic, in setting the right goals. Be realistic and honest. It'll cut down on a lot of time. If we're not, the only people we're going to be fooling is us. Choose the right fit. It don't, you don't have to transform. If you can transform, brilliant. If you can do that 180 degree turn, great. <coughs> but it might be just one ratchet at a time. Even that will work. I remember when I used to do war, I used to live in northern Italy. I used to do a lot of alpine walking once upon a time. The first time I ever went, I was in my late 20s, I was, I was in really good nick, and I went with an uh, alpine guide who was well into his 60s. And the Italians have a thing when they're walking in the Alps called il passo alpino, the alpine step, and it's just a very gentle lope at around about three miles an hour. And when we set off, I thought, this is a bit dull, isn't it? You know, this guy, I'm going to be following him around all day. Within an hour, I was at, my lungs were bursting. Because with the alpine step, irrespective if they're going uphill or downhill or over obstacles, they don't stop. They just keep going. It's like a metronome, no matter what. No matter what. What it does, it basically helps them to be able to calculate distance when they're walking in the mountains. Otherwise, it's impossible. Because you're going at six miles an hour downhill, one mile an, up, one mile an hour uphill. They don't. But even if they're going downhill, they'll lope. The Il Paso Alpino. And it's exactly the same thing that I've spoken about is patience of virtue. In this sense, it is. 
just look at plate tectonics. Okay, that's my first, so I'm checking on the, checking on the time here. That's my first half. Second half, we're going to come on to the deeper understanding. understanding. I'll crack on a little bit with this. A deeper understanding. Acceptance, the A word. Again, like we spoke about patience in the first, in the first section, acceptance can have the same effect, particularly in the corporate world. It is seen, is sec- acceptance is seen as a certain docility, a certain non-proactivity, it's being reactive. The sort of acceptance I'm talking about is acceptance of the way things are right this minute. Looking backwards over our shoulders into our past. Accepted what is, is. What has happened, has happened. If we're stepping off across that line to our, our goals, our nutritional or our lifestyle goals, and we take baggage with us, we cannot build anything positive on negative foundations. So if we have guilt... Uh, particularly people who have weight issues, there's guilt, shame, people who get out of puff when they're playing with their kids. They can feel irritation, frustration. And so before they even step off to start better lifestyle goals, they're taking with them that baggage of feeling down about themselves. Put the bags down. If it's happened, it's over. I doesn't mean to say this is not absolution. If there are consequences, if there are commitments from our past, that means they're present, that means they're functional, we have to deal with them. I'm talking about inert emotions from what's happened in our past. So if someone is overweight, so I'm overweight. But the second you step off, know I'm going to do something about it. It's immaterial if you haven't done anything about it for the last 20 years. Absolutely, absolutely immaterial. Ancient history as dead as Julius Caesar. It's what happens next that counts. God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. It's a great quote. It's a slightly, this, this quote comes in two forms. I particularly use that personal form. Fear of failure. It's huge. This is a huge, has a huge effect on the goals we set and the, and the expectation level. Fear of, fa- fear of failure is about seeking approval. We're social animals. It's perfect nat- perfectly natural for us to want to seek approval, seek acceptance from our, uh, from our peers. It's perfectly natural. We're talking about when we pursue external worth to feel of value. We seek other people. We seek other people's approval of us. That is a hole that will never be filled. It's like putting fuel in the tank of a car. Other people's expectations. More than half the time we spend projecting onto other people what we believe their expectations to be. So we can be setting goals for ourselves on the basis of a complete myth. Something that we project on other people. The world is, we do not see the world as it is. We still see the world as we are. We see people around us as we are. We don't know what people are thinking. I love it when someone says, oh, I know what you're thinking. No, you don't. (laughs) You haven't a clue what I'm thinking. Other than this, failure is not an option. This is a great 1980s movie mantra. And the worst kind of hard motivation nowadays. Failure is not an option. In fact, to to, uh, outlaw failure is the claustrophobia of creativity. Yeah? There is nothing in the ascent of of, of humankind that has been achieved without failure, understanding the nature of failure, trial and error, trial and error. Human beings rise and fall. We are not defined in falling down. We are defined in the getting up. We're human beings. We're remarkable. Our doubts are traitors and make us lose the good we oft might win by fearing to attempt. I always like to put it that failing isn't failure. Quitting is failure. Mindfulness. Does anybody practice mindfulness or meditation? Okay. Mindfulness is very, it's a very, very good exercise. It's a very good practice to adopt um, in order to observe what we are thinking, what we are feeling. And it does help us when we're setting goals and when we're understanding the pressures we're under in, in our society. Mindfulness is, a very sim- is very simply um, 
about moment-by-moment -moment awareness on purpose, in a given moment, without judgment. And one of the quick ways of doing that is by, medita by a very, very simple meditation. It's which is essentially a breathing exercise, put very simply. It's a little bit more than that, but it's essentially a breathing exercise. It's concentrating on our breath to the exclusion of other thoughts that may intrude. If other thoughts do intrude, which they will, 80% of our thought process during the course of the day has no purpose whatsoever. It's basically on a reel like those, uh, like the old uh, cin cinemas in the, in the silent er er eras going <laughs> all the time. Yeah? It boosts our mental energy because we are reducing what we're thinking about. Our mental energy is, the, is, is one of our greatest assets. And if we can boost our ment mental energy during the course of, of a working week, it's hugely important to us. Distractions and temptations. If we are mindful, if we are aware of what we are thinking about, we can see di distractions and temptations coming down the road. I have the sweet tooth from hell. I know all about distractions and temptations. <laughs> it's common knowledge that heaven gave us muesli, but the devil hit back with Maltesers. I'm telling you, <laughs> it's a fact. Focus, see the success. Mindfulness helps us to see success. Just like, that, just like um, elite sportsmen do. You'll know about this, Adam. When they will sit and they will imagine they will run through, step by step, succeeding, winning, and even having setbacks and how to deal with this. If I ask you to think back to a time in your past when you've been distressed or felt embarrassment, acute embarrassment, or shame, or deep upset, if you do it for long enough, you'll begin to feel those emotions that you had. It could be years ago and you'll begin to feel them you will begin to have the physical effects. If it's a matter of stress, a very stressful meeting or an embarrassing time, your palms will sweat. You'll become stiff in the shoulder and in the neck. You may even, you may even be moved to tears. You can do exactly the same thing with a positive experience. Not just thinking back, but looking forward. So it's a great way of cementing our goals. So when we speak about getting sidetracked, a great way is to actually sit back down, why did I set that goal? Because if it's part of you and not, put, not given to you by someone else or assumed for the reasons we spoke about before with motivations, if it's part of you, it's far easier to reboot that goal. Steve Jobs said, you have to work hard to get your thinking clean, to make it simple. But it's worth it in the end, because once you get there, you can move mountains. In sa enhancing self-belief. I don't use Henry Ford very often, but this is a, a very used quote, but for, with good reason. Whether you think you can or whether you think you can't, you're probably right. It's very true. To paraphrase Gandhi, what we think we become. It starts and ends with a thought, with the head game. If ever I deal with people who have uh, weight issues, for ex as an example, I say, lose the real weight. The real weight is up here. The rest will follow automatically, guaranteed. You lose the real weight. If you don't lose the real weight, that's why you find it so hard. Because there's something that's holding you back. Enhancing self-belief, very quickly now. Belief in the power of rational thought. We spoke about this before. Irrational thought contribute zero to positive advancement. Irrational thought being nobody likes me. Unless you're Attila the Hun. That's, you can't say that. It is not a rational thought. I am useless. I am no good. I am an idiot. These are irrational statements. They're not true. We have to deal with the playing field as it is as it really exists. Belief in your ability. Vince Lombardi, the great American football coach, said, play to your strengths. Why would you want to do anything else? Remember when I said stepping off into what we are capable of doing? It's our strengths. It's our call. It's our territory. Belief in your circle. Let's surround ourselves with people who are really in our corners. Positivity is contagious. So is negativity. That doesn't mean to say we have to turn our back on friends who are in need, absolutely not. But let's make sure we keep the balance right. Let's keep on target with people who have our best, who have our best, 
our best at heart. Okay? Enhancing self-belief. Belief that it's your decision. You own your thoughts and behaviours. We're responsible for reactions to people and events. If we take ownership, we have clarity of choice. Okay? And call to action. We'll run straight into this. I was inspired by the great Sun Tzu quote in The Art of War, of all places. The greatest victory is that which requires no battle. This isn't a battle. If you fight for a diet or for a health regime, you won't win because you're fighting yourself. Can't work. It's not possible. This is not a fight. You've got to do what is inside you. This is an inside job. Thanks for listening. Adam, your call for action. Thank you.